important is the naming of your works to you? With a title, you're giving the observer some indication where to go, and sometimes titles are quite enigmatic. What do you consider when naming your work? Well, for the last 15 years, all my names have the, the article in the beginning. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the discovery or something like that, mm -hmm. which makes it very specific, a very a specific pointer to something that um, almost like you're pointing in a map to a larger right. territory yeah. and as if the work was revealing an aspect of a large vast landscape mm. which required that specificity. Mm. Um, so that's the first thing I consider in naming mm. the works. Um, and sometimes the titles emerge naturally in the process of working, sometimes it comes from my writings. You'd always have to be a title that 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 does is is reveal or unconcealed by the work or vice versa that by putting that title something gets mm. revealed about the work although not always in a supportive sense sometimes as you said it could be enigmatic or sometimes contradictory to what appears to be a place and then I, I like to think of the two of them together the title and the work as an inseparable pair that mm. the friction between them mm. is what is really creating the meaning mm. rather than just the meanings in the work and the title is just like a cataloging data or something. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think for most people looking at art when there's, the title is Untitled 3 or something, it's always a bit dissatisfying um, when you're looking at a work of art. But then the other extreme of that is a sort of precious naming of things where it's almost has seems to have no relation and somebody's just called something something to make it more than it it really is so i think it's um like the impossibility of death in the mind of the living which is <laughs> the damien hearst name for his frozen shark so that is a way exactly. to, to <laughs> don't get me on <laughs> <first. laughs> that's a way to to give it a tremendous gravitas to something that probably requires less unfair Yes, no, I completely agree. <laughs> um, on commercial talk radio, there are a lot of talking heads. Uh, there's a lot of people with very strong opinions proselytizing. And my aim with my show from the beginning has been to uh, make people think, not to tell them what to think. And I'm wondering if that's a differentiation that you see between different kinds of art. I mean, this kind of segues into Damien Hurst, but some art just telling you what to think. Um, and some aren't making you think. And I'm wondering where you see that work, your work on the spectrum. I mean, I'm assuming that you are looking for your work to make people think, but maybe that's not how you think about it when you're creating it. Maybe think is the wrong word as well. Well, I, I am creating my work as an inquiry, mm -hmm. so I can understand, I can understand something better. And then the hope is that that inquiry will serve someone else. But the work is never created in a thought-provoking manner, like I know something, which then I'm going to put out to the world for the world to think something, like consciousness right. raising yeah. type of thinking. Right. I find that not only distasteful, but, but quite arrogant. Mm. So, so my work, I only do, I only create, create work because I don't understand things well enough. And the work is my way to try to aim at a better understanding. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the work is both a testimony of that inquiry as well as the pointer towards some discovery. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that there's someone out there who will see the work and, and some of that will happen for that person. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking itself and as, as as such, I mean, I find when there's a lot of um, thinking, uh, like recently, all these art people may, may be criticizing a political condition, and yet at the same time, will be celebrating the heavy thought of someone like Ai Weiwei. Um, I find it to be very uh, crude way of thinking that this. Thing that I can understand 
generates this thing that I can understand and therefore generates this thing that I can understand. And all of that I find it to be uh, kind of a relative pedestrian and immature idea of mm. what the con connections and deep insights that art can produce um, are. I mean, they're, mm. they're really, it's trivializing the process of, yeah. of art in such a way um, just because the implied statements and implied ideologies are respectable and respected mm. does not necessarily mean that the work itself is respectable. Mm. Um, that just because you have, you know, great intentions and good ideas does not in itself make an artwork be transformative in any way whatsoever. Mm. And in fact, it's predictable. And quite often, as time passes, when we look now at an 18th century work, we we no longer have an urgency with the ideas that mm. were presented then, and what we're left mm. are with whatever else was cooked into the work, as for example, the disasters of war by Goya. I mean, you can look at those works mm. and you don't necessarily think of the Napoleonic Wars, you just think about something about the human condition. And and those things are there because Goya was able to do to, to, to bring mm. that into the work. Yeah. But the specific political conditions of that moment are lost to us and they don't have any urgency. Nobody feels anything for that Napoleonic Wars, but you feel something for that individual suffering. Yes. Yeah. I've just been revisiting the Blau writer recently and I think, you know, Franz Mark and Kandinsky talk about that a lot, how, you know, um, real works of art are, are timeless in that sense and also that, I forget how Franz Mark puts it exactly, but works of art that are created from um, real, really truthful place stand with each other regardless of the form form of the art and I think that's somewhat what you're speaking yeah. of yeah yeah I mean I think great works of art are in many ways in many many ways the same mm. the same and I mean we're used to thinking so much of visual arts as as it looks this way or looks that way but once you move that out of the way and you have the experience of a great work of art and you look at Leonardo or Giorgione, or you look at Monet, and you stand in front of them, the kind of light that comes from this work is quite similar, even mm -hmm. though the embodiment of them may be quite different. And the reason why it's different is because in order to channel that light, Manet, as an 18th, 19th century person, have to handle things very differently than Velasquez working in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but the light itself is, is quite similar. Mm. Um, and that, and it is that light ultimately that is is art. Mm. That's what art it really is. Yeah, and I think you know we were talking about the kind of precious naming of works of art and things like that. And I, I think that um, if one has to really explain what a piece of art is, then it's failed in my opinion. And I think that with a lot of the shock art, that's where the public kind of faith in art, certainly in Britain, I think it a lot of people just felt very lost about what art meant anymore because it's like they had to read 10 books and you know before they could stand in front of it and know what it was or, or feel it whereas my opinion is that you should feel something in front of a great work of art without knowing anything would you agree with that or is that too black and white well i mean the Usually the problem is the 10 books you have to read to understand the work of art are not very good books. <laughs> uh, I think if you have to read, you know, two Dostoevsky books and two Tolstoy books to feel something about a work of art, you probably will not be that, that bad. No. But if what you have to read is some sort of um, pontificating, justifying, relatively mm. superficial pieces of writing that are very topical, to the ideas that may be fashionable at a particular moment mm. in time, then that reading always seems to be no much more than a, than a prop. Yes. Um, so, 
That being said, in the same way that, for example, I can, I can encounter you and, and, and have a direct experience with you without any knowledge of your history. And I get an information about you, I get a feeling about you. If I knew all the things about you, mm. if I knew your history, if I mm. knew where you come from and all of that, I will have different points of entry mm. into who you are. Yeah. So I'll be able to experience you maybe differently. Mm. But so so it doesn't mean that I cannot experience you without that knowledge, mm. but that I will have a different experience if I have that knowledge. Mm. So so if you look at say a painting by Velasquez of Philip the Fourth, you might have a different relationship to it if mm. you knew a lot about Velasquez, a lot about Philip the Fourth, a lot about their relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now you have a different point of entry, but it is not necessary to confront a work of art that is mm. that is transformative. But ultimately art is a knowledge mm. of sorts. And and that knowledge comes through experiencing. So demanding that say so you don't if I don't think all day long I have a job and I never think about art and I never think of what it does. And one day I encounter a work of art and I demand and expect that this thing that I never thought about before will do something for me that's also an irrational expectation mm -hmm. any more than if i mm -hmm. are not used to looking at say uh, the concerns of a journalist and what makes a great uh piece of journalism versus just a trivial one mm -hmm. and i never thought about it and i never read any news mm -hmm. and one day i come in and open a piece of journalism i'm supposed to be able to deconstruct all the assumptions underneath mm -hmm. that that article or the validity of it that would be arrogant for me to say that with no preparation and no history and no relationship, mm. I should be able to discern what's good from not from not, not from what's not good. Yeah. So I think that we do need mm. we do need exposure and thinking and engagement. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think about my work twelve hours a day, and I've been doing it since I was pretty young. Mm. So. Somebody stands in front of the work and say, well, I don't get it. Well, for me, <laughs> the first seven months that I was working on that painting, I didn't get it either. Mm. And I was looking at it for a long time. Yeah. So that somebody doesn't get it in the first five minutes, it's like, yeah, that's okay. Mm. How much longer do you want to give it? But then usually people don't want to give it more. So if it doesn't pay, mm. with, uh, it doesn't reward me within the first five minutes, I'm moving on. Mm. And that's, yeah, there's something. Yeah thought about that. Yes, yeah. That's a, that's a good distinction to make, I think, and um, it's part of, well, the problem with people just increasingly with social media being in echo chambers, you know, of, of um, if that's all you're hearing and understanding, then, like you said, you're going to be limited in how you can understand something really outside of, of your experience.